could tit for tat turn into all out war. It was Iran's first direct attack on Israel, but 99% of munitions fired were repelled. Still, Israel has vowed to respond in spite of warnings from its allies not to escalate. So where could this latest standoff take the region and the world? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmakers are Iran and Israel. There's never been any semblance of peace between Iran and Israel, but arguably never have they come this close to war. As Iran marks its annual National Army Day, President Ibrahim Raisi is warning of a severe response if Israel attacks again. And after meeting with Israeli leaders, UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron says it is clear Israel has decided to respond to Iran. Now that's despite earlier warnings from Israeli allies not to escalate further. And it's all led many to fear we are on the precipice of war. Let's take a look at how we got here. On Saturday night, more than 300 Iranian missiles and drones were launched from Iran, Iraq, Syria and Yemen towards Israel. Tehran says it is in direct retaliation for an Israeli strike on Iran's embassy compound in Syria in early April. That strike killed seven members of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, including two commanders. Israel, with the help of the US, the UK, France and Jordan, shot down 99% of the projectiles. The United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia shared intelligence with the US ahead of the attack. And despite its size, Iran's salvo caused minor damage, mainly at the Nevatim Air Base in southern Israel. Iran's operation was entirely in the exercise of Iran's inherent right to self-defense as outlined in Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations and recognized by international law. This concluded action was necessary and proportionate. On Monday, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu convened his war cabinet to consider a response. Government spokesperson David Mensah said Israel is exploring all its options. And speaking at the Nevatim base, the army chief warned Iran that it will face consequences for its actions. We are considering our next steps, and this launch of so many missiles, cruise missiles and drones into Israeli territory will be met with a response. Israel's foreign minister, Israel Katz, also called on dozens of countries to sanction Iran's missile program and designate its revolutionary guards as a terrorist group. Yet Tehran says any further Israeli action will get a severe response. If the Zionist regime commits the slightest act of aggression against our soil, this will lead to a more ferocious and severe response. The West, meanwhile, has urged Israel to show restraint. The US has pledged to support Israel, but also made it clear that it will not join any counterattack. I'm not going to speak for the Israelis. Uh, that is a decision for them to make in terms of what they do, uh, if they do it, and how they do it. But again, from a U.S. standpoint, um, you know, we continue to uh, make very clear that we don't seek a wider regional war. Despite concerns that the region and the world cannot afford another conflict, tensions remain at boiling point, and the long-time adversaries are on the edge of a full-scale war. So let's get some perspective now from Nataf, Israel. And Avram Burg is an author and former speaker of the Israeli Knesset. Avram, thanks so much for being with me. I'm speaking Merhaba. actually to you because you just published an article in Prospect magazine saying if Israel continues to wage war, even facing a barrage of missiles from Iran, it will have betrayed its own friends. First explain that. Where, where are we? At your short clip, it was actually a an ugly demonstration of the competition of mine is bigger. You hit me, I'll hit you harder. You took off one eye of mine, I'll take two eyes of yours. And everybody, us and the Iranians, are competing who is, who, who is the strongest thug in the neighborhood? That's an option, very legitimate, very logical, happened in so many conflicts. You, me, me, you, you, me, me, you boxing. By the end of the boxing match, 
both sides are bleeding and half dead and lost their conscience. There is another option here. What happened the other day, I mean, just uh, by, by, the end of, of, by the end of the weekend, is that a world coalition, very, very interesting one, got together from the United States of America to the Saudis, from the airspace of the Jordanian to the information coming from the Emiratis, Israelis, pilots, intelligence community, political alliances, created a kind of a regional coalition that says we can function against this kind of threat against the state of Israel, but we would like to see it as a part of a larger world order. And the decision that Israel has to make, and it's a kind of a T-junction, do we continue with the ongoing conflict and the ongoing slap and slap back between us and the Iranians, us and the proxies of the Iranians, or do we join forces with the world coalition of our friends and colleagues and partners and collaborators in order to reshape the Middle East? Mm. And this is actually an historic decision. Where do we face with the region and with our own country? More conflict, more violence, more bloodshed, or a better future? Okay, but just to be clear, I mean, you were saying that these are kind of friends of Israel that have come to its defense, but there are those who will argue they're not friends of Israel's, they're just more enemies of Iran, particularly if we look at what's reported to be the intelligence given by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, for example, and Jordan still disputes the fact that it helped in any way. But then again, they don't want Jordan, wouldn't be in their interest, to have Iranian missiles flying over its own airspace. So are you sure these are friends of Israel coming to their common defense? Listen, for sure, the definition of friendship in geopolitical arenas are not as close and warm and significant as being friends on Facebook, okay? And unfriending in the political arena is a little bit more costly and much more painful than just, I don't like you anymore, and that's it. But cooperation, collaboration, coordination, getting together in front of a, of a larger threat is a kind of a friendship. Is it mm. uh, my be BFF, mm. my best friend forever? I'm not at all sure. Mm. So, I mean, if you describe it as a minimal friendship, uh, that's fine, but these minimal friends, and, and actually maximum friends with the United States, have asked Israel, please de-escalate. Enough. Don't respond. And now we've had David Cameron coming out to say today that uh, Israel has already decided it will respond. So are they betraying, is Netanyahu betraying what you think are the friends that have been helping Israel, and how will that end? Netanyahu is a minimal leader if we talk about minimal and maximal. Netanyahu is the worst leader ever, leading a segment of the Jewish people, ever. Since the beginning of Jewish history, we never had such a bad person, a malicious individual, cold-blooded manipula manipulator, opportunist, and a no-leader. Yes, he was technically democratically elected to be the prime minister of Israel. But yes, he is actually the servant, maybe even the slave, of his own very extremist, religious, zealots, quite limited, primitive, extreme ministers. And therefore, when Bi President Biden, a fantastic human being, the elder of the tribe of the Western liberal democracies, says to somebody, don't, he says to Israel as well, don't. And I believe that the same way we try to communicate with the Iranian people, saying the Iranian regime is not necessarily the Iranian people, so should people treat us. The Israeli people are not necessarily Netanyahu. Mm, okay. Avram, we will unfortunately have to leave it there. I'd really like to thank you so much for joining us. So let's speak further now about where the Israel-Iran escalation could go. And joining me now from Tehran, Fouad Izadi, associate professor at the University of Tehran. From Washington, David Jonas is the former general counsel of the National Nuclear Security Administration. And from Boston, Rami Khouri is a distinguished policy fellow at the American University of Beirut. Thanks all so much for being with me. 
Fouad Izadi, your president has vowed again to respond if Israel attacks. So let's just clarify if that is to say Iran has already retaliated fully for what happened to its consulate in Syria and will not attack again unless Israel moves first? True. Uh, Israelis attacked the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Uh, Iran um, had to respond under Article 51 of the UN Charter, self-defense. Uh, consulates are part of the country's territory. This was a red line for Iran. Iran has been telling people, don't attack us, don't attack our the soil. So uh, Iran responded, uh, and that uh, portfolio is closed. Uh, if Israelis attack again, that's a new portfolio. Iran will respond, I think, in seconds. They're not going to wait for a couple of Okay. I mean, Israel's allies have asked it to please not escalate this further. But today we heard UK's, the UK's foreign secretary say Israel has already decided to respond. No details on how. So where does that leave Iran? How far will Iran go? It depends uh, on what the Israelis do. If they attack uh, Iran, if they attack Iranian embassies like before, um, uh, I don't think, I think the plans are made to respond. It mm. uh, depends on what they do. Uh, and uh, my suggestion to Israelis, uh, Passover is near, uh, wait for the holidays, and then forget about it. That, that would be a good policy, I think. Let it go. David Jonas, what are the chances Israel will take that approach? Very difficult to say. Of course, let's be clear on one thing, and that is that Iran has been, this is nothing new in terms of Iran's attack on Israel. Iran has been attacking Israel through its proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, now for months, or if not for years. So what is new here is that the series of air attacks, drones, missiles that Iran just launched at Israel is the first direct attack from Iran against Israel. So that is new. So the fact that, that Israel literally shot down 99% of them doesn't mean that there wasn't an attack. Now, there's been a lot of encouragement from the international community, so to speak, of having Israel not respond, which is remarkable because no other country would be told to stand down when attacked. It's kind of rich to me that the United States, at least the administration, is telling Israel not to respond when if another nation launched 300 drones and missiles at the United States, I can assure you the United States would respond. Okay, but then, I mean, it's, it's kind of obviously a double standard here because Iran, being a sovereign nation, should be... It should be acceptable that Iran responds to an attack on its consulate in Syria. And yet here comes the United States now considering sanctions, more sanctions on top of what's already there, which is quite considerable, on Iran for responding. Yes. Uh, the, 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 of course, Iran has been sanctioned multiple times over the years by the United States and the international community and the UN Security Council. Uh, unfortunately, Iran does not seem to have a tendency to observe international law, treaties, agreements, UN Security Council resolutions. So, and I think that Iran has managed fairly successfully to evade sanctions. And so I'm not sure that sanctions is an answer to anything at this point. Let me ask Rami Khoury uh, where you see this going. I mean, is, is Israel just saying that it has already decided it will take action when in truth it knows it's not a good idea to go against what its allies have recommended? and escalate this further with Iran? Well, Israel has shown very clearly in this episode and others that it doesn't particularly pay much attention to what its allies recommend or, or, or suggest to it. Even the U.S., which it is pretty heavily dependent on for its military and security uh, needs, the, the Israelis are pretty much out of control. If you look at what they're doing in, uh, in Gaza, the whole world virtually has uh, seen them as being involved in a plausible genocide. They're getting a hundred, votes of 152 to 3 or something like that in the General Assembly of the UN. So Israel is a, is a loose, uh, loose cannon. It's, uh, uh, and it'll do whatever it feels it is, uh, is best for the security of Israel and or the political incumbency of, uh, of Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, those two factors have to be uh, looked at together in Israel now. This is not just a national security issue. It's a political survival issue for an indicted uh, 
uh, prime minister. Right. Uh, that is. So, uh, I mean, we've heard it said that Netanyahu actually needs this war to survive. I mean, could going after Iran for as devastating as this could be to both populations, and as much as it would anger his allies, just keep him in office and, and ensure his political survival? Well, that's a pretty reckless way to, to run a country and, and use your military power. Israel is immensely powerful uh, offensively and defensively quite powerful, but what we've seen is they're not invincible, both in, uh, in Gaza, from Gaza or from Iran or, other, or, or from the north. And so this is a very, very delicate situation, full of danger if people act uh, hastily or uh, with abandon. Uh, so you need cooler heads uh, to be involved here. The Iranians and the Israelis have been uh, fighting each other for decades, really, um, clandestinely and now a little bit more uh, openly. Really, the most, I think, the most dramatic new element here is that the United States has been involved in fighting against six different uh, groups of countries or uh, armed non-state actors uh, in the Middle East in the last couple of months. Uh, and you've got now these two kind of, I wouldn't call them coalitions, but you have the Israel and the U.S. and Jordan and a couple other countries uh, on one side, and you've got Iran and its supporters in the Arab region uh, on the other side. And so you have two camps now who are engaged in a direct uh, military fighting or have been last were last week. Uh, we want to try to contain that, not uh, not expand it. And, you know, the thing to remember, this all started in Palestine, in Gaza. Mm. Uh, so you've got to go back to the beginning, solve right. the Israeli-Palestinian... Be before you go conflict. too far, though, uh, I, I want to pick up with Fuad Izadi on those two camps you just referred to, because, yes, Fuad, I mean, there is the analysis out there, even if Jordan, for example, says that it was not working in the defense of Israel when all those 300 missiles and drones were actually shot down. Um, but there are other analyses that say, hey, Israel rallied its allies against Iran, which included getting intelligence from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates. Jordan helped out, plus, of course, the U.S. and the U.K. coming to its defense as well. Where does that leave Iran feeling in that it's a bit more potentially isolated than even some others thought? Because this isn't just about we're fighting together for the protection of the Palestinians. When it comes to Iran, it's the fellow Arab states are not going to defend it in any way. You know, uh, the Arab states can answer for themselves whether they actually did all these things. But uh, the people who have been witnessing the genocide in Gaza in the last six months, whether they're in the Middle East or Africa or Latin America or East Asia or in the United States, um, they like what they, saw, what they saw. You know, thank you, Iran was number one trend uh, on Twitter. And the reason is that people are sick of seeing an average of 100 uh, women and children get killed by the genocidal regime in Israel. So they wanted to see someone answering that. Uh, obviously, Iran attacked uh, Israel because of the attack on Iranian consulate. Uh, but uh, many people in Iran are quite happy. They came actually to the streets. One reason I think the Iranian government uh, engaged in this manner was to address the public opinion inside Iran. Uh, so Iran is not isolated. Uh, you don't have to be a Muslim or an Arab to be disgusted with the genocide in Gaza. You just have to have a little bit of uh, humanity in you. And most people have that. But what? Uh, what just what tell us then what Iran actually makes of potentially Jordan, Saudi, and the UAE helping Israel defend itself in this case. You know, if they did that, we have we have people who are denying that. But if they did that, uh, they have to, you know, helping a genocidal state is not a good idea. Uh, sooner or later, Israel has to answer for the genocide that they're committing. And whoever helped Israel, whether it's the United States or UK or France or Germany or the Arab countries, if they did that, then they're going to be participating, helping a genocidal state. They have to answer that. It's their responsibility to 
to make sure that they don't do that. You know, at the United Nations, we had a, a General Assembly uh, a resolution, a responsibility to protect. If you see a genocide uh, taking place anywhere in the world, you're not supposed to be watching, you're not supposed to be helping the country that's committing the genocide. You're supposed to be helping the people who are uh, the victim of genocide. Okay. And if the, this countries did that, if they helped the genocide of the state, it, it, it's something that they have to answer for. But David Jonas, is there a dynamic here that means, you know, these aren't necessarily Israeli, Israel's friends coming to their defense, but they are Iran's enemies working against it in this specific context and completely making the Gaza issue exclusive in this case? Well, I, I hate to even hear the word genocide because it's absolutely inappropriate. And Israel is conducting itself in accordance with international law. And its military is probably more careful than any other military in terms of uh, sparing civilian life and being careful of civilian life. It's, it's under Israel. question in international law. That's why the ICJ has said that genocide is plausible. Okay, Rami Khoury, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Israel has refused consistently since the 1930s to come to terms with the reality that Palestinian people who made up 90% of Palestine uh, at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century uh, that have the same rights in that land as Israelis do today. Uh, the Palestinians and Arabs have made that offer. All the Arabs have said they live in peace with Israel in the 67 borders. Uh, the Israelis simply are not interested in this kind of arrangement. And that's why this conflict keeps going and keeps expanding to the point now where the United States has fought against six different armed groups and countries uh, in the region. And in this last episode last week, we had a total of, I think, 13 or 14 different countries involved in various uh, ways uh, in, in the fighting. So there is a way to stop it, uh, which is to address the underlying political uh, issues. Uh, and, and this is something really that uh, all the actors have to pay much more uh, attention to. Yeah, and, and that seems so far off is the problem, Rami. So, I mean, at, the, at this point, though, knowing that most parties involved just want to stop the escalation of what is happening, particularly between Israel and Iran, where are the true deterrents here to stop that escalation? What can be done? In the first case, I mean, if Iran says that it's finished, it, it sought its retaliation and it got it for what Israel did to its consulate in Syria. What can stop Israel now from taking this further? If you're asking me, I would say the only thing that could stop Israel is some common sense among its, uh, among its leaders and its political and military uh, elite. Uh, that Israel has to, Israel wants to live in peace in the Middle East. The Arabs have made that offer. 57 countries, uh, Islamic majority countries, have joined the Arabs in making that offer. Uh, so the only thing that would stop Israel from doing, continuing to attack uh, is to find an alternative to militarism to resolve its conflict with the Palestinians and, uh, by extension, the other people in the region. Iran and Israel were very close strategic partners before the overthrow of the Shah. I'm not advocating for the Shah, but I'm saying that there's no inherent problem between Iran and Israel, except today, the, the Palestine issue has become, has become one. So the Israelis have to feel that they're safe, they're secure, and the Palestinians want the same thing. So do the Iranians, so do the Syrians. They want to know they're not being attacked or sanctioned or threatened or assassinated by rogue uh, actors, whether they're the US or the Israelis or any, anybody else. It seems so simple, it seems so obvious and that you solve the underlying political conflict and you have no more uh, threats of warfare. Uh, why we don't move in that direction uh, still baffles me after 55 years of covering this issue uh, as a journalist in, in, the, in the region and talking to people on all sides, including Israelis and Iranians and Americans. Um, David, so there's something... Do you, David, do you, you seem to think that that sounds, what, naive? I think it sounds very one-sided not naive. Fawad, uh, we're down to our last few minutes. Uh, we, we know where Iran stands on the Gaza conflict and it wants what it wants from Israel, which is what Rami is also describing. We just talk peace and stop not just this military offensive, but the uh, occupation of the territory anyway. 
it's not happening, and Iran is now engaged. Iran is now also facing punitive, more punitive sanctions because it is doing what you've claimed, defending itself. Where does Iran go from here? If it's, if it's going to have to face more punitive action from particularly Western states in its quest to defend itself? You know, Iran is proud. Iranian leaders, a lot of Iranian people are proud of uh, supporting the Palestinian cause. The Iranians were ashamed of the support that Iran's, uh, the Shah of Iran gave to Israel. So uh, th this is what Iran is all about, uh, resisting uh, occupation, resisting pressure, resisting American imperialism. And, and yes, it's going to have a cost. They're going to sanction Iran. And you know, Iran's military has been able to advance, and you saw an example of what Iran can do a few nights ago under sanctions. So you can sanction Iran, and that will actually help Iran to develop indigenous military capability, and that's what Iran has done. So uh, as long as Israelis don't attack Iran, I don't think you will see the repeat of what you saw a few nights ago. But if Israelis want to expand the war, if they want to attack Iran again, I think we're going to have a bigger war and Israelis are going to be responsible for that. Rami, are you confident at all that this will not escalate into full-blown war when we've got each side, including even Hezbollah, vowing retaliation for every action taken? Well, everybody in the world uh, will retaliate if they're attacked, so there's no question about that. Um, I think the question here is, have, has each side taken enough action to satisfy its, uh, its sense of manhood, um, you know, and that sort of uh, Rambo um, uh, sentiments. And, um, and they just, people don't want to be occupied and attacked and subjugated and threatened and, and sanctioned and subjected to plausible genocides. Um, so I think the possibility for full-scale war is always there, but it's really pretty minute. I mean, nobody in their right mind wants to see the Israelis, Iranians, Hezbollah, and others, and that would bring in the Americans probably, uh, at least in a defensive role. Uh, nobody wants to see that happen. It's, it's just crazy. Uh, it's reckless. But we have uh, reckless uh, leaders in many parts of, uh, of the region, and we have genocidal leaders uh, in Israel. And so this is something that really has to be calmed down. And the United States cannot do this by itself. The United States uh, is a direct party to this conflict. It is guarantees by law, its own laws, that Israel will be superior militarily to all <clears throat> the combination of its foes in the region. So you need to bring in some, some more serious uh, actors, mediators, uh, impartial parties, global powers that work with the U.S. Uh, and others, the U.N., to calm the situation down and, and get back to some kind of political focus to okay. resolve the underlying which is tough but doable. Mm. Rami Khoury, that will have to be the final word for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.